I'm sure by now, many of you have seen these two pictures. Truly pictures that say a thousand words. The supposed leader of the quote, free world, US President Joe Biden, holding a leaflet with instructions printed upon it. If we read the leaflet, which has not been edited, we can clearly see that the bullet points on it are guiding him to do things that should either be standard procedure or otherwise completely self-evident behavior in a meeting. Whilst there is humor to it, it is a tragic form of humor, and it is frankly embarrassing and makes for damning reading. Instructions such as telling him to enter the room and greet the participants, sit in his seat, wait for the press to enter, give brief comments, naturally with the stipulation of two minutes maximum, otherwise he might ramble, wait for the press to leave, ask one of the attendees a question, thank the participants, and then depart the room. Surely there is little to no doubt by now that he is not making his own decisions and likely never was. If he is a puppet, it's clear that the real powers that be can no longer hide the strings, even though they would obviously want to, in order to keep up the mirage, they have no choice but to give him the notes, especially if they want him to do their bidding. Because even though this president is controlled by elites above him, and would thus do as he is told anyway, without the notes, the oligarchy have had to create this contingency plan in case he makes a mistake or goes off script, not because they want to, but because he can't even be trusted to successfully do as he is told without this excessive instruction. He has made so many gaffes in the past and is so incompetent and dysfunctional that he needs the script to remind him to say and do things that he didn't even devise himself. If you thought Jeb Bush was low energy, there are real Weekend at Bernie's vibes to this whole scenario. Biden is nothing more than the bumbling sidekick or paper champion to real masterminds behind the scenes. It's commonly thought that politicians are puppets anyway, without it even being demonstrated as blatantly as this. But there is no other way of getting him to do as he is told. Even the connotation of having to put the word you in bold capital letters would be an insult to anyone with personal agency and a reasonably functional brain. But for him, it is necessary, which shows he is no leader and commands no political authority and no respect, not even the typical illusory version of it that we are traditionally accustomed to. The current state of the world from a Western-centric position is so farcical, and yet there would be more than enough people who believe we are in a current state of cultural progress and who would confidently tell you this with little to no evidence to support their claim. Frankly, if this is not evidence of strings on a puppet, I don't know what is. Usually the strings are intact, but invisible. If anything, this is blatant evidence of decline. It doesn't get much more obvious. It's a decline of culture, leadership, competence, and confidence. Even the confidence of rulers in their subjects. Not to suggest that they ever had much confidence even in healthier epochs. It seems to be evidence of oligarchy, shadow governance, or what the neo-reactionary Curtis Yarvin would call the cathedral. In ancient Greece, the term kiklos, translated as cycle, was used by a number of classical authors to describe what they considered to be the cycle of governments in a society or the cycle of regimes. It was based upon the history of the Greek city-states of the era. It was first elaborated by Plato when he distinguished 
the five types of regimes that follow a cycle. Aristocracy, Timocracy, Oligarchy, Democracy, and Tyranny. According to Plato, governments dissolve respectively in that order from aristocracy to tyranny. An aristocracy is ruled by aristocratic people whose rule is guided by their rationality. The decline of aristocracy into timocracy happens when people who are less qualified to rule come to power. Their rule and decision making is guided by honour and by the ownership of property. Timocracy devolves into oligarchy as soon as those rulers act in pursuit of wealth. Oligarchy devolves into democracy when the rulers act on behalf of freedom. And lastly, democracy devolves into tyranny if rulers mainly seek power. Other writers that discussed Kiklos include Aristotle, Polybius, Livy, Machiavelli, and Vico. Whilst we may not be following the cycle to the letter, the veil of democracy is thin, and there is ample evidence to suggest our current epoch is one of oligarchy. Caesarism would eventually follow oligarchy. Under Caesarism, all power and authority would fall to one leader, as opposed to the current scenario where small groups or special interests possess the power and authority, whilst leaders act as figureheads but answer to the demands of the oligarchy, thus appearing as leaders in name but not in fact. It is worth mentioning that depending on where you sit in the political spectrum, just who the oligarchy, the other man, or they actually are, is something that may differ, and thus can subjectively be simultaneously different people at the same time. People have had their theories as to who is to blame. For example, the Jew, the white man, the capitalist, or the communist. But the one thing that is universally agreeable is that the game is utterly controlled. Who it is that's in control is where the debate, tension, and political division arises. But sentient individuals notice the current general air of inauthenticity and discontent. They know it is a game. At the present time, this is the only way we can objectively discuss such things, regardless of who you believe is responsible. At the very least, if you can recognize the game, then you are outside of the matrix and you are alive and thinking. This fundamental discussion of power can be broken down into the dialectic of esoteric and exoteric. In an oligarchical scenario, or government by the few, the few being a collection of powerful elites, the power is esoteric or occultic and hidden from public view. There is evidence to suggest that elites and special interest groups do possess power, influence, and the ability to make decisions. But just how much power and influence is possessed, and precisely what decisions are made, is what remains unknown. Due to the esoteric nature of the real power, a lack of societal trust develops and there is a perceived lack of legitimacy heaped upon those who hold the title of apparent leadership and power, but seem incapable of exercising it. Joe Biden is one such example, and his incompetence has been highlighted by the right and left alike. The topic of where the real power lies becomes increasingly open to speculation and subsequent conspiracy theory from all sides of the ideological spectrum. As mentioned earlier, people certainly have theories as to who is to blame for the perceived ills of society, but then no one can say with absolute certainty. Societal problems are never as simple as the political ideologue makes them seem. The ideologue may point out symptoms of the problem, but ultimately the problem is man and human nature itself, 
and it cannot necessarily be solved. This is what we have to deal with and accept. It could be argued that social degeneration or moral decay are symptoms of a deeper spiritual issue, or an obvious deliberate rejection of traditional concepts of virtue and a rejection of the requirement or naturality of divine order in the societal microcosm and the universe as a whole. Perhaps man can thus be deemed holy or unholy in that respect, or at least there is a spectrum or necessary balance. Regardless of who is in charge politically, corruption and depravity will always exist in many forms. So then, perhaps the likelihood of political salvation is slim to nil, as the true nature of man's problems is not political but spiritual. Yet, some examples of perceived great esoteric power are attached to secret societies like Freemasonry, the Illuminati, and Bohemian Club, as well as think tanks such as the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Bilderberg Group, and the World Economic Forum Davos meetings. Obviously, topics of a sensitive and important nature get discussed, but the content of such discussions is rarely, if ever, disclosed. These esoteric societies and elitist think tanks make decisions which then filter down and get implemented by the exoteric institutions like the Congress or Parliament. There are examples within popular culture of a hinting or unveiling of the elite and their esoteric societies, the influence they yield, and the pension for, shall we say, extracurricular activities of a nefarious nature away from public view. The best demonstration of this comes from the 1999 Stanley Kubrick masterpiece, Eyes Wide Shut. Neo-reactionary theory would thus argue for the necessity of making power more genuinely exoteric again by reinstating a modernized version of monarchy, because then, ideally, the people or subjects would know who is making the decisions and who is meant to be accountable. Given that greater accountability, legitimacy, and transparency is the ultimate goal, it certainly makes for a compelling argument. In this scenario, actual visible sovereignty would be reinstated, as you would actually know who is sovereign in fact, and not just by our concept of the law. Oligarchs are sovereign individuals, but are unaccountable because we don't know who they are for sure, and we don't know what decisions they have made, but we do know that they wield some influence and their decisions were likely made in their own interest as opposed to the public interest, which is awfully convenient for them and would obviously be the reason they wish to remain largely anonymous. Yet in a monarchy, the interest of the sovereign and the interest of the public are the same. The monarch's interest and public interest would have to be the same, otherwise there would be legitimate consequences for the abuse of power, rather than little to no consequences, which is where we are now. It is no wonder that the elite oligarch wants to maintain this regime. Who wouldn't in their position? Only a man of genuine morality, of which, arguably, no such man exists. A great resource for information on topics such as this is the writer and YouTuber Oren McIntyre. Oren's influence is growing within the community. I have paid close attention to a number of his videos, and his insights are often relevant and largely accurate, in my opinion. So he deserves some credit for his good work. He is the person who properly introduced me to neo-reactionary thought, and thus Curtis Yarvin. I had heard of Yarvin for some time under his pen name, Mencius Molbug, but never investigated his thought until I came across Oren's channel. Oren regularly references the works and thought of the philosophers Bertrand de Juvenal, 
de Maestra, James Burnham, and Carl Schmidt, the last of which being the one I am currently most familiar with. Much of the work of these thinkers centers around the notion of monarchy versus parliamentarianism, monarchy pertaining to where the exoteric sovereign makes decisions and decides on the exception, the exception being the point in time when action ought to be taken outside of the rule of law to maintain order, parliamentarianism pertaining to where the exoteric MPs follow the decisions of the esoteric oligarchy. The American conservative essayist Michael Anton, who is an expert on Niccolo Machiavelli, and the publications of the Claremont Institute are worthwhile resources for greater insight into the cycle of regimes. Senator Palpatine, or Darth Sidious, is a perfect fictional archetype to demonstrate the embodiment of initial exoteric power as a Senate member, then esoteric power as a cloaked oligarch lurking in the shadows, and then absolute power as an emperor or Caesar-like figure, the ultimate fictional example of becoming consumed by megalomania. Yet of course, Star Wars was not the only franchise to feature the archetype of the oligarch, the other most popular example being the head of the Spectre organization in the James Bond series, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. The rotating chair and the evil genius petting a cat has become an iconic recurring image, to such a degree that it has been parodied many times for comedic effect, most notably as Dr. Evil in the Austin Powers franchise, a satirical version of James Bond. There have been a number of influential elites through history who seem to have taken up the mantle of the Machiavellian oligarch. One wonders if there are other such wannabe supervillains lurking in the shadows, and it remains to be seen as to what role they may play in future events. I'm not really going to discuss the neo-reactionary movement or its specific theories any more than I already have, as thus far I have only dabbled in it and wouldn't yet consider myself worthy to make further comment as I prefer to be informed rather than just opinionated on a topic before discussing it in any greater depth. But the latter part of this video could thus be seen as necessary for at least building awareness, sparking discussion, and raising important or necessary questions. So I'll leave you to ponder on the content for yourself.